Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, of the ages of all ages, Amen. It's beautiful when every few years, uh, Pentecost and Father's Day come together. I don't know if you ever noticed that before, but uh, every few years or so you'll notice that Father's Day being the third Sunday of the month and, f and Pentecost coinciding with it. It's a beautiful occasion for celebration and a beautiful occasion also to meditate on the meanings of being a father. God the Father has given us everything and has prepared for us everything from before the foundation of the world. From before the foundation of the world, He has been preparing us and preparing for us everything that has to do with our salvation. And sending us the Holy Spirit as the gift, as the comforter, is the culmination of what we've been celebrating since the beginning of time. If you notice also the fact that we celebrated Christmas throughout every year, we celebrated that God is with us, that God is preparing us for eternity. Then after that, we celebrated God for us on the cross on Good Friday and in Easter. Then finally, we look at Pentecost, which is the culmination of God in us. Right? It's no longer just we hear of God or from the beginning of time people questioning or wondering about God, but God in us. This is the glory that He has given us. That's what the Lord Jesus said, that He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. These are huge things to meditate on, and we can't just do it in 10 minutes or 5 minutes. It's something we ought to meditate on and contemplate daily. So the Holy Spirit is not just some sort of entity. The Holy Spirit is not something. The, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. He is your helper. I would like you to, as we begin the Apostles' Fast tomorrow and we enter the season of the church where we focus on the Holy Spirit and His work in us and in the church and how the culmination of all that is through the mysteries of the church and we go to Him for everything. Remind yourself that the Holy Spirit is your helper. He helps you in everything. We want to focus on that today. The Holy Spirit is your helper. So meditate on that. And as you fast, the apostles fast. You notice how today the litany of the third hour was prayed after the reading of the Acts. Usually it's prayed in the morning, right after matins. This is a good litany and an essential and, and valuable, precious litany for you and I to pray daily. The church has put it in, in the Agbeya and the canonical prayers of, of the hours for a reason. They're there because these prayers help us connect with the three persons of the Holy Trinity throughout the day. So focus on the third hour prayer over the next few weeks. So like we were saying, Christ for, with us in Bethlehem, Easter, God for us to redeem us, today God in us to be dwelling us within us forever. And the Lord Jesus promised that and said so in John 14. The Holy Spirit, who is the, the person who you will know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. God in you. So, I want you to look at this picture and think of God your helper, the Holy Spirit your helper. This person represents each and every one of us one time or another. When we feel weak, we feel discouraged, we feel dry, we feel incapable of coping or continuing another day, and you have these muscles that don't belong to Him, don't belong to us. This is the Holy Spirit's work in us. He strengthens us and equips us and makes us capable to cope and to face and to continue. This is the meaning of Him being our helper. St. Paul tells us in Romans 8, likewise the Spirit also helps. See, the word help is there. In our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. With groanings that are too deep in our hearts for words. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us by interceding on our behalf that He lifts our heart and the prayers that we need to say when we don't even know how to say them or when to say them, He is interceding for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is one of the ways He helps us. So how else does He help us? There are many ways we can look at the titles of the Holy Spirit and how He helps us and what He does for us and for the church. 
But three, four important points to remember that the Holy Spirit helps us through. First, He convicts us. We want to focus on what that means in a second. He teaches us. He sanctifies us and He comforts us. Remember these four characteristics of the Holy Spirit and how He helps us in our infirmities and in our weaknesses and our troubles and our pains. So what does it mean that He convicts us? We'll start with that right away. The Lord said today, John 16, it says, And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, first of all, remind yourself that the devil will always condemn you. Whatever sin you have committed, whatever things you may have done, whatever guilt you feel upon you, the devil will condemn you for it every time. He will encourage you towards sin and then condemn you for it to keep you from Christ. The Lord, on the other hand, will convict you. He will remind you that you're his son, you're his daughter, which means that you're royalty. You are purchased by and redeemed with royal blood. Therefore, you are not just something either. You have now become a son and daughter of Christ, a man and woman, a boy or a girl, a person in the image and likeness of God. Very precious in His sight. So He will convict you when there is sin looming around you or you're struggling with, He will convict you. Meaning that He will tell you, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not for you. You don't belong in this situation or that sin. You know better. I can help you. Trust me. Listen to me. Don't just walk into something that you know you shouldn't be doing. He will coach you out of it. He will encourage you. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When you feel the Holy Spirit's voice telling you, do this, do it. And when you feel the Holy Spirit's voice telling you, no, don't do this, don't do it. The sooner you will listen, the sooner you will hear, the louder and clearer His voice will be in your heart. But the more you resist the Holy Spirit, the more you ignore His voice and His call to do this or not do this, the more confusing things will get and the harder it will be for you to decipher whether is this from God or not from God. So this is the conviction of sin. He convicts of sin. He convicts of righteousness, meaning that He tells you, you know what, why don't you wake up a few minutes early this morning and pray. He will wake you up earlier out of nowhere, before your alarm clock, once in a blue. Take that as a call, a conviction for righteousness, that He's trying to lead you into dialogue and communion with Him. He will convict you of righteousness, meaning He will encourage you and remind you and, and coach you to do the right thing. He will convict you of righteousness all the time. He will lead you to do the right thing if you will listen. And again, the sooner and faster and more swiftly you listen, the clearer that voice of conviction will be in your heart to do the right thing. You will be convicted and convinced to do the right thing. And you will convict the world of judgment. There will come a time... And he said that the time is coming. The second coming will happen. Those who will refuse and resist day in and day out, saying tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, there will come a time when there will be no more to tomorrow, to, to next week, next month, next year. These will have evaporated. Time will have ended. This is just something you wear around your wrist, but this does not control your time. He controls your time. And the time will come when there will no be no more time. Tomorrow won't happen. The day after won't happen. The week after won't happen. The month after won't happen. And so on. It will be Jesus Christ yesterday, today, and forever the same. We will continue with Him. So He will convict the world of judgment, meaning that those who have chosen to refuse and resist the invitation to eternal life and holiness and righteousness, who have put it on the back burner till tomorrow next year, they will be judged by their own tongue and their own intention. This will be their decision. So these are the convictions of the Holy Spirit. Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now he says that he will teach us. The Lord says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Everything that the Lord said to the disciples came back to them in remembrance. And he taught them through the Holy Spirit day in and day out till they completely overturned the world and even the Roman Empire into Christianity. This is the work of the Holy Spirit through earthen vessels, as St. Paul says. He will teach us, and He teaches us and reminds us. But the question for you and me is, are we teachable? Are we coachable? Are we correctable? Are we willing to listen to the lessons being given to us? The Lord teaches all the time. Are we willing to listen? 
Are we willing to cooperate with that teaching of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives or not? So ask yourself that question. If you're not, you can become. You can become teachable. You can become coachable. You can become correctable. But again, it, it's a personal choice. It's a personal invitation. No one can force you to do it. Ask any one of us who's been to school, kindergarten, elementary, high school, sage up university, whatever. You can sit there, like some of you are doing right now maybe. I don't know. Only you know and only God knows. You could look like you're listening, but you're completely out to lunch. It could be. Who knows? I can't know. Only God knows and only you know. Only you know. People have sat in classrooms for years and looked at the teacher like they were fully focused and flunked the class. They weren't there. They were there physically, but in here, they were somewhere else. Again, personal choices. We can either change that or remain as we wish. Hopefully, we'll change it to the way God wishes for our salvation. So He teaches us and He sanctifies us. This is the will of God, St. Paul says. This is the will of God, your sanctification. From the day you were baptized, and chrismated, you received the Holy Maroon 36 times, anointed you completely, just like you were set apart, just like the altar set apart for the liturgy and for consecration of prayer. You were set apart for Christ. You were set apart, apart for eternity. Every part of your body was consecrated for eternal life. Every part of your body to enable you to walk the walk with Christ, regardless of the difficulties. He sanctifies, He sets you apart. And he said, I do not pray that you should be taken out of the world, but you should be kept from evil. You are kept from evil because you're sanctified. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Again, the choice of following that sanctification, reminding myself that I am set apart for Christ, that I am not meant to live as the world, but I am meant to live as a son and daughter of Christ, is a choice to accept or not. So it goes with the conviction and the teaching the sanctification. The Holy Spirit, St. Paul says, is a consuming fire. Although He can consume everything and burn it up into nothing, He doesn't with us. He gave the disciples an example that the Holy Spirit descended upon them as tongues of fire. Consuming sin, but igniting righteousness, making them fiery spirits. This also is for you and for me. And He comforts us. St. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He is God, the God of all comfort. Regardless of sadness, sorrow, fear, any of the negative things of this life, of this world, the Holy Spirit is the comforter, the paraclete. And we're gonna, we'll be chanting the beautiful hymn, Asumain, as of this morning's the distribution of the mysteries all throughout the Apostles' Fast to remind us of this wonderful love of the paraclete, the comforter. When you seek comfort, don't seek it from things less than God. It will not fulfill you or satisfy you. Seek comfort from God and follow the steps He gives you by obeying His voice in conviction, teaching, sanctification, and comfort. The Lord says at the end of today's Gospel in John 16, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. God did not try to sell you something. Oh, it's going to be easy and fun. And No. He said it will be tough. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world for you. Like we said last week, we already know who wins at the end. The Lord Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has conquered. And even it says in Revelation, He comes conquering and to conquer. He is the conqueror. And He makes you more than conquerors because He loves you. That's what St. Paul tells us. So hold on to that. When you feel the need for comfort, go to Him. And go to Him by communion, fellowship. When the priest dismisses you at the end of the liturgy, he says, the love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the gift and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, right? That the fellowship, the communion, the interaction, the cooperation of the Holy Spirit be with you. How? By cooperating with Him cooperating with Him back. I leave you with this verse, St. Paul says, as one of the ways to remember how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Don't desire things that don't belong to you, and especially things that don't honor Christ. Let your, contact be without co your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
That way you're going to be able to boldly say, the Lord is my helper. The Holy Spirit is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. St. Augustine, and I promise this is it, a prayer. You can look it up online. St. Augustine's prayer of the Holy Spirit. He says, breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love. But what is holy, strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. Pray with the Holy Spirit. We tend to pray, our Father who art in heaven, in Christ Jesus our Lord. But we seem to think that the Holy Spirit does nothing to say to Him. And yet, the prayers of the Holy Spirit are constant. The fellowship with the Holy Spirit is constant. Take the litanies of the third hour starting today and pray them daily and see the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the work that He will do in your life. There's also a beautiful book I recommend to you by Pope Shenouda III of Blessed Memory. It says, The Holy Spirit and His Work in Us. Read this book. You'll find a PDF of it online. Beautiful book to give you more ideas and understanding into the person of the Holy Spirit and who He is and what He does in your life. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.